Thank you for joining us tonight and uh, for the second in an eight-part series, The Essentials of Oral Health, uh, exploring topics in preventive dentistry and periodontics, uh, periodontology. This is sponsored by Johnson & Johnson. We thank them. And it is offered exclusively to members of the Next DDS uh, user community. I'm Ken Markowitz. I'm on the faculty of Rutgers School of Dental Medicine. Um, I'll be your speaker this evening. I, I currently serve as an investigator in a number of studies looking at uh, risk factors for uh, uh, aggressive periodontal disease in children, um, as well as longitudinal studies of uh, caries in a young population. Uh, I'm also involved in uh, some clinical studies of antimicrobial agents, so I've been in this topic for uh, quite a while, I'd say. Um, I'm also uh, conducting studies of caries, uh, caries detection devices in the laboratory and hopefully clinical studies of those as well. Um, and I teach a lot of course materials pertaining to caries, dental pain, uh, tooth sensitivity is one of my, my biggies. Um, I also pharmacology, I also teach uh, clinical and preclinical operative dentistry to all, basically all of our students. And I also practice in our faculty practice. So I'm very interested in this topic and I'm very happy to be with you this, this evening. Uh, my presentation tonight is entitled Managing the Relationship Between the Teeth and the Oral Environment. And I'm looking forward to our, our time together. A uh, couple of little things here. Our presentation will run approximately 45 minutes. And um, you can post questions. Let's just see this. Good. Uh, you can post questions using the tool at the bottom of the screen. I'll collect them and maybe some of them I'll address, you know, as we're going along or we'll get to them at the end of the presentation, whatever seems best. Okay, so without any further business, uh, we shall begin. So the oral environment and the teeth. Dental health is really a result of the relationship between the teeth, the periodontal tissue, and the oral environment, okay? So let's get used to this changer here. So basically our learning objectives tonight is to discuss the components of the oral environment, the role of saliva in the prevention of dental disease. So, so dent saliva is really critical. We'll see what happens when people don't have enough saliva. And, and as soon as you guys start seeing patients, if you have not already done so, you'll see there's a big difference that saliva makes. And we'll review how bacteria form plaque, uh, microbial colonies, and what we call biofilms. Okay, so plaque, the stuff that people get on teeth, is an example of a bacterial biofilm. And that's really the important thing in dental health. Okay, what kind of biofilm? Not just so much whether there's a biofilm, but its type. We're also going to discuss a little bit uh, antimicrobial agents and their role in controlling the biofilm and, and stabilizing the intraoral environment. Okay, the oral environment could be thought of much like a marine environment. I don't know if any of you guys are into scuba diving or snorkeling or anything. Um, when I go, they, they make me wear a life, life vest. They're afraid I'll drown, but I still get a, get a little bit of a look. The oral environment consists of a substrate, which could be things like rocks, things that organisms can attach to, the organisms themselves, and the medium in which all of these interactions go on, okay, which in the oral cavity is the saliva. So we can think of the teeth as a substrate, okay, we can think of the biofilm as biology, okay, and the saliva as the medium, okay, and basically the way the, this interaction occurs is very, very, very important to really determining uh, whether we have healthy mouths or whether we have various types of dental disease. Okay, so this shows you really the variability here. Okay, now these are all disease states. Actually, what I don't have here is what we might consider really an optimally healthy mouth. But this is really all problems caused by changes in the oral ecology. Okay, so what we see in the uh, upper left here are the 10 upper baby teeth of a young child, the, the, the 10 maxillary uh, primary teeth. 
And these teeth have been literally destroyed, rot, rotted down to the gum line by caries. Okay, this on the uh, upper upper right is an adult with severe caries. Okay, what we see on the bottom here is calculus and periodontal inflammation. So this individual, we don't really see too many caries here. So they don't have one type of ecological problem in their teeth. They have a different type, okay? So they have calculus, bright red gums would bleed very, very easily. Uh, we don't have a radiograph here, but certainly probably bone loss because of this. And this is also part of the, the, the oral ecology. Now this person pretty much does the right things, okay? This person here on, on the lower right has pretty clean teeth. You don't really see much calculus or plaque there. You don't really see gum inflammation. However, what they have is they have loss of the tooth structure at the necks of the teeth and on the exposed root surface. Okay, so they have a oral environment where their teeth don't have bacterial infections per se, but are actually wearing and eroding away. And that's also a perturbation in the uh, dental ecology. Okay, so. The oral surfaces, or oral surfaces are really basically the substrate medium biology interaction. And we can consider basically two types of substrates in the oral cavity. The soft tissue, which we can call the squishies, and the teeth, which we can call the crunchies. Okay, the soft tissues have exposed cellular surfaces. Uh, most of the cells in the oral soft tissue at the surface shed, so they don't stick around very much. Organisms can bind to the soft tissue, however, they will eventually fall off at, as these uh, cells shed. Consequently, the soft tissue themselves don't really develop very thick biofilms. However, they are used to basically anchor many organisms in the oral cavity, so they're very important but you may not actually even see the accumulations of organisms there. In contrast, the crunchy surfaces, the teeth, are the, the dental hard tissue, which in the crowns of the teeth is enamel. Okay, has low solubility. Okay, it doesn't shed. It's, it's pretty stable. And it is a binding surface where proteins, first of all, can, can bind to. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. And that's where really complex bio, bio, biomicrobial communities, which we call biofilm or plaque, develop is on the surfaces of the teeth. So before we saw the calculus and the plaque, okay, on the, that, that one picture, that's basically a, a community that develops on the teeth themselves. Okay, so enamel. Enamel is very important in caries and in a lot of other you know, host disease states. Enamel is basically a salt. Of, I say that's, it's weird. It says a salt. You think of salt, you put it in water, it dissolves. Well, enamel is a very non-soluble, very insoluble salt of calcium, phosphate, other things called hydroxyapatite. It dissolves very little in water, okay, but the solubility is increased in low pH. So in acid, hydroxyapatite teeth will start to dissolve. Okay, so that's very important in understanding the caries process. Okay, that the teeth are relatively stable. However, acids, various types of acids, particularly the acids produced by bacteria, can dissolve the teeth because the solubility increases at low pH. Okay, so enamel, even though it's pretty stable, there are certain things that will damage it. So mechanical abrasion. Okay, what we see here is an older fellow, okay, and we see that the biting surfaces of the lower front teeth are worn down, okay. Uh, there are abrasions on the root surfaces we see here on the, the lower, uh, lower right of this lower, of this upper left picture here, okay. Uh, abrasion lesions. Now, what we see in the upper right is very important, okay. Everyone should take a good look at this picture, look at textbooks, look at the internet, find other pictures, because this is important stuff. This is the result of 
acids coming from the patient themselves, so patients who make themselves vomit, regurgitate, will get erosion of the lingual, the tongue sides of their teeth. So if you look at these upper front teeth, they're all flattened out. Okay, you can see a rim of enamel uh, surrounding the yellow dentin. That is usually caused by acid that enters the stomach through this, uh, I'm sorry, enters the mouth through the stomach and the esophagus. And that wears away, erodes away the lingual, the tongue sides or the palatal sides of the upper teeth. This is very important because people that habitually make themselves vomit and don't have adequate nutrition, don't have adequate caloric intake, can die. Okay, this can be a fatal uh, eating disorder. This can be a symptom, a sign of a fatal eating disorder. Okay, so we are, as doctors, we examine our patients carefully. We recognize important signs and symptoms of, you know, dental diseases and also things that can injure the patient's health. So we had a patient in the clinic that was a bulimic that made herself vomit, and she actually had disturbances of the potassium in her body, okay, because she makes herself vomit. And that could be fatal. You know, you, you could literally die from that, okay? On the lower, we have electron microscope pictures, a little experiment uh, I did with some of our pediatric residents where we took enamel, we covered part of it, okay, and we exposed the other part to various soft drinks. Okay, so in the case of the uh, lower left, it's uh, Pepsi. In the lower right, it's Diet Mountain Dew. Okay, now who doesn't like Mountain Dew? I love it. Okay, but it is very erosive. So what we see is that on the top of each uh, each each picture, uh, there is the intact area, and then there's this step where you fall into the eroded area, and even though diet sodas don't have sugar, they're still, in a sense, bad for our teeth because of their erosive potential. Uh, fruit juices do the same thing. Orange juice, uh, grapefruit juice, um, any of you from, black, uh, from England, black currant juice, which is actually very tasty, is also quite erosive. So these juices, uh, even if they don't have a high sugar content, can still damage uh, the, the dental enamel. Okay, saliva really mitigates a lot of this, the, these effects. Okay, saliva is very important in maintaining the homeostasis, the stability of the oral cavity. Saliva has a lot of important things, least of which is not water. Water is very important, electrolytes, including calcium and phosphate. Okay, so as saliva is produced, the duct system modifies the saliva, increases the amount of sodium, also increases the amount of bicarbonate. So rapidly produced saliva is actually more alkaline. Okay, and that's important. Okay, we'll get to that in one second. So many of the useful things that saliva does is it simply has a mechanical washing effect. So when you eat sugar or you ingest acid, the saliva flow washes that away. Okay, uh, pellicle formation, we'll talk about one second, is an interaction between the proteins in saliva, proteins, because saliva is not water, it's more like, like milk or like a soup. It contains protein, and these proteins stick to the two surface. Buffering effect is very important, so buffers. So there, we, the, the bicarbonate comes into play. The faster the saliva flows, okay, the higher the bicarbonate, and actually the better buffer it is, the more alkaline it is, and the better buffer it is. So when do we have rapid saliva flow? When we're either thinking about eating or actually eating. So you know, at home, you come home, you smell the nice food, go home for the weekend, whatever, you smell nice food from your family, you start to sal salivate, okay? The rapid stimulated saliva has a very high bicarbonate, and that's actually the best saliva for buffering acid. So our teeth are, in fact, more resistant to caries during a time of heavy saliva stimulation than times of minimum saliva stimulation. We'll think about that and go back to the ramifications of that in one second. Plus, 
uh, saliva has a bunch of specific and non-specific antibacterial activities. We're, we're doing some very interesting experiments where we have mice that have a knockout for a bacteria protective gene, and these mice can get horrible caries. Okay, I hate to say it, but um, so I'm a mouse dentist in addition to everything else. They get very, very bad caries, okay, because they lack this protective uh, factor in their saliva. Pellicle, okay, so the proteins in saliva will stick to the hydroxyapatite surface of the enamel. Enamel is very, very, very sticky stuff, okay. So enamel has a lot of exposed calciums and any anionic surface groups, you know, from uh, organic acids, phosphates, etc., can stick to the calcium and hydroxyapatite. So once the tooth is exposed to the oral environment. So let's say you get your teeth cleaned or you brush your teeth, okay? The second the saliva hits your teeth, you start forming this layer of proteins on the tooth surface called pellicle, okay? So the proteins adhere to the tooth surface, then they sort of join together to form a continuous film over the tooth surface. Pellicle is very important, okay? It does a lot of great things. It actually protects our teeth. It protects our teeth from acid. It protects our teeth from dissolution. It acts as nature's lubricant or shock absorber for the teeth. So if we don't have pellicle, people that have low saliva flow, they literally grind down their teeth very rapidly because they lack this natural lubricant layer. It's kind of like that motor oil that bonds to metal parts and is a sort of natural lubricant. It, it's very important. Pellicle, however, also is the site of bacterial attachment. So bacteria have evolved ways to utilize the pellicle as a means to attach to the teeth. Okay, so that's the first thing in an infection that any infectious organism has to do. It has to attach to the host. Okay, it's got to be able to attach to the host, stay alive, get food, and if it causes disease, it has to cause tissue damage. So organisms have a variety of mechanisms to attach to the pellicle, to other things in the oral cavity, to attach to themselves, and to attach to the extracellular molecules that they create. So they secrete basically matrix molecules that form this, that basically fill up the space between themselves. And they attach to that, they attach to the pellicle, and then they also attach to each other, okay, through these, these, these molecules. Okay, so there are a variety of mechanisms where bacteria can very, very rapidly attach to uh, oral surfaces, okay? So, uh, let's see, so we did an interesting experiment where we had little squares made out of hydroxyapatite, okay? And we placed these squares in like uh, like an orthodontic retainer that people wore in their mouths. And then at various intervals, we took these squares out and we measured the amount of bacteria that was attached to the square. So you could see that, now this is different groups which we don't need to be concerned with, but basically over time, uh, this is the count of microorganisms and these are time points. So basically these are repeating sets of numbers. But between five minutes, two hours, four hours, up to seven hours, there is a very rapid increase in the number of organisms that you get on these squares. So by seven hours, you got over a million, or you got millions of organisms on these little squares, okay? So this increase in organisms is caused by the attachment of the cells to the surface, attachment to each other, and then ultimately cell division to start forming a plaque or a biofilm on these squares. So we could do this, see this in teeth. We can see this on other surfaces that, uh, you know, we see in the oral cavity. Ultimately, you know, you get different stages of this, and ultimately you get a mature plaque, a mature biofilm, which usually induces inflammation in the, in the gingival tissue. Plaque is very interesting, very complicated. So if you look at plaque, what you see is that there are colonies of different species of bacteria embedded in this matrix. Sometimes there are channels, like fluid-filled channels, w running through the plaque, running through the biofilm, 
and you see basically this segregation of different organisms. So there are organisms that are relatively common near the tooth, okay, near the pellicle where the, the first attachment was. Other types of organisms that only enter the plaque after the plaque has matured, after it's gotten fat, you know, big, okay? So these are later colonizers. Plaque is a very, very complicated environment where under some some circumstance, you know, some ways of looking at it, it's very difficult for bacteria to live here because they're competing with one another. On the other hand, they're also helping one another. For instance, uh, the metabolites, so let's say the, a nutrient gets into plaque. One bacteria breaks it down and partially uses it as a nutrient. Its metabolic breakdown products can then nourish other organisms. Okay, so sometimes they cooperate with with each other in terms of nutrition. What's very important clinically is the fact that within plaque, the organisms may be protected from antimicrobial agents. Okay, so this is where we have to be very, very alert consumers, okay, because we have to understand that agents will only be effective in preventing or treating dental disease if they can kill plaque within the biofilm. Really early example, uh, my chair uh, found this, this is really a, a amazing story, was found by Anton von Leeuwenhoek, the inventor of the microscope back in the 17th century. Okay, so he scraped off the plaque, you know, I'm sure people back in the 1600s had lots of plaque. No heart, no difficulty finding that. Uh, scraped off some of the plaque from his tooth and looked at it under his microscope and he saw what he described as little animals swimming around. Okay, he didn't really know about bacteria. They thought the little things were, were animals. Okay, he would mix the plaque, chop it up, basically divide it, mix it with vinegar, and find that essentially, oops, I accidentally, okay, and found that um, basically killed all the, all, all the organisms, okay? If he then rinsed his mouth with the same vinegar, the bacteria were resistant, okay? So the bacteria are hard to kill if they're in the biofilm, but easy to kill if they're kind of spread out, what we call planktonic, if they're just sort of floating in their media then they're easy to kill. So that's very important when we, we evaluate antimicrobials to, to know that they can kill in a biofilm. Okay. So some examples, some mechanisms of action of antimicrobials. Um, basically, uh, the, the two surface, most biological surfaces, our hair, skin, etc., are anionic. They have fixed negative charges. Many antimicrobials are cationic. So uh, Cytoperidinium chloride is a monovalent cation, so it doesn't stick very well to oral surfaces. Okay, it'll pop off oral surfaces. Divalent cations such as chlorhexidine, okay, uh, Peridex, Perigard, the number of, it's it's sort of generic now, uh, is a divalent cation, so it will stick. It has what's called substantivity to oral surfaces. So it will stick to oral surfaces, hence it is a fairly effective antimicrobial agent. Some um, common antimicrobials we use, chlorhexidine, okay. Problem with chlorhexidine though is since it is so sticky, it will stick to the surface of plaque and it really doesn't cut through thick plaque. So it's really kind of effective. It, 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 it's best use, or the way I use it is, when patients have relatively clean teeth, if you want to basically maintain periodontal gingival health, then Peridex is useful, okay? It doesn't really just kill masses of plaque. What it'll do in those cases is it will stain the, the teeth and actually cause increased calculus formation. So it's used for very thin, thin plaque. It's good for that. Essential oils like uh, what's found in Listerine, they're not really that sub substantive. They don't really stick to surfaces. What they do do, however, is penetrate biofilms. They kill bacteria very effective even in biofilms. They uh, basically disrupt bacterial adhesion, uh, the production of lipopolysaccharide, which is an important toxin of gram-negative bacteria. So that's important in gum disease. 
Okay, so it's very good at at cutting through uh, established plaque. Okay, triclosan, which is found in Colgate Total, is uh, basically formulated in Colgate Total with a polymer that helps it stick around. Actually, gives it substantivity in the oral cavity. By itself, without this polymer, uh, where it's actually not sold in the United States, in, in o overseas it's sold without the polymer, it doesn't appear to be quite as effective. But it has a pretty good broad spectrum of essentially just lowering the counts of a wide variety of organisms in the oral cavity. None of these things will sterilize your mouth, okay, or, or patient's mouth. Many of them can be used as essentially an, an adjunct to mechanical means of oral hygiene, you know, brushing and flossing, the usual. Okay. The development of the plaque really is very important in determining the type of health situation we have in the mouth. If patients maintain a thin plaque, relatively thin microbial accumulation, which is what I show in the middle of this diagram, that's pretty consistent with healthy. Okay, thick plaque can go in a number of directions to cause disease. Thick plaque where uh, the organisms deep in the plaque become anaerobic, the environment is uh, deprived of oxygen. Those uh, types of organisms, thick subgingival plaque, will start to break down tissue, produce tissue irritants and toxins, lead to inflammation and soft tissue damage and ultimately bone destruction. This is what we call periodontal disease. Okay, so periodontal disease is caused by thick plaque where there's anaerobic organisms, okay, which will break down proteins mostly, okay. These, pro these uh, bacteria will also liberate sulfur compounds from protein, which will give people stinky breath, okay, scientific term, stinky breath. In contrast, thin plaque, oh, I'm sorry, thick plaque, which is exposed to sugar, and if it has certain organisms in it, okay, if certain organisms are present, can start breaking down that sugar into acid. And that's the type of plaque that can lead to caries, okay? So you can have a cariogenic plaque, a thick plaque that's cariogenic, a thick plaque that is producing gum disease, or relatively light plaque which is consistent with health. There is no need for us to sterilize or try to kill or you know to be a germ nut. Okay? What we want to do is change the ecology of our patients' mouths towards health. Okay? It's not a it's not a question of trying to sterilize everybody's teeth and kill every bacteria. Okay. That's not the goal. The goal is to shepherd, essentially lead the oral environment towards health. Okay, calculus. Okay, calculus is where there is thick plaque, where the plaque organisms essentially die and more or less fossilize because of calcium from the saliva. Okay, so ca calculus is found. This is a, uh, basically just a patient that walked into my office uh, with an old pair of dentures. Okay, and there is calculus on the lower lingual surface of the denture near those ducts, you know, from the submandibular and sublingual gland, uh, okay, and uh, the duct from the parotid gland, Stenson's duct, okay. So basically where there's saliva duct, if there's plaque accumulation, that plaque will be subjected to high calcium concentrations and will eventually mineralize forming calculus, tartar, okay. Caries producing plaque, basically, uh, strep mutans is an organism that is not the only caries producing organism, but it is an organism that can cause caries. Some very interesting experiments were, or, or clinical studies were done looking at children, and it was found that the subdivide, subdivisions of strep mutans that are present in children in this study always match the ones that were in a mother, in the mother. So we have the model that strep mutans and possibly other caries producing bacteria can essentially be inherited from, not, not inherited in the genetic sense, but transmitted from the mother to the child. Okay, so it's very important that we address the 
dental health of you know of of mothers of of women who are considering contemplating having children pregnant and have young children so basically this organism the caries producing organisms attach to the teeth so when the baby teeth first erupt if there is transmission of strep mutans from the mother to the child then strep mutans can establish itself in the child's mouth and the child will then be susceptible to caries. So very important public health measure and unfortunately we are not really, I don't think we're doing this as well as we should, is to lower strep mutans and other caries producing uh, organisms in the mother. Okay, and the way you could do that is restoration of large lesions, uh, oral hygiene, dental cleanings, and possibly also the use of antimicrobial agents, like possibly chlorhexidine or other things, to reduce the amount of these organisms in the mother's saliva. So, you know, if it's in the mother's saliva, you know, you you, you taste the food, you give the baby the spoon, um, you know, I have children, we all do this that kind of stuff, kissing, etc., and then basically the organism can get from the mother to the child. Okay, acid production is very important. Sugar, when we metabolize sugar, we totally break it up to carbon dioxide and water, releasing a lot of energy, okay, in, in ATP. The bacteria that cause caries don't break up sugar as well as we do. They break it down to, to lower molecular weight organic acids, mostly acids, mo lower molecular weight compounds, mostly acids. Okay, really some energy, but not as much as we do, not as much as our full oxidation uh, does. Okay, so these bacteria produce acids when they break down sugar. Okay, so it's very simple, very simple process. Basically, the bacteria eat sugar and pee pee acid. That's a very good way to explain it to patients. Everyone understands it. Okay, so... Sugar is really the f energy source that fuels acid production. Okay, so one way to address this is to use sweets that have non-cariogenic sugars. Okay, so many water com soluble compounds taste sweet. You know, even lead salts. That's why babies eat lead paint. Okay, sugar al as uh, alcohols like sorbitol, uh, other compounds that are used as artificial sweeteners cannot be metabolized by strep mutans to produce the acid. Xylitol is an interesting sugar substitute, or I think chemically it's considered a sugar alcohol. It gets into the me metabolic machinery of the caries producing bacteria. However, it somehow mucks up the works. It kind of gets into the metabolic machinery and it has a, a toxic effect on these bacteria. So it is not only a non-caries promoting sugar, but it actually can hopefully, you know, the, 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 the clinical data here is a little complicated, but it is hoped that xylitol will also reduce the amounts of these bacteria in, in the mouth. Incidentally, in some countries, uh, xylitol is used to reduce uh, inner ear infections in children, you know, using xylitol candy. So it appears to have quite a bit of an antimicrobial uh, effect. The public health data linking sugar with caries is extensive. Uh, a historical example that I like is uh, during World War II in many European countries there was restrictions in sugar. There was rationing. There were food sh shortages, you know, especially, you know, the countries that were occupied by, by the Nazi Germany and stuff like that. There was not a lot of sugar to be had. Okay, so there was a drop in sugar con consumption. Well, one unintended side effect of that was that there was also a drop in the caries incidence in various age groups over a number of years, okay? And uh, eventually, the caries incidence rebound once, you know, happy days were here again and sugar was available again. But there was good evidence that sugar was linked to caries. There are many, many other uh uh, other examples. In Greenland, uh, the, the Inuits did not have caries until they were given sugar by, you know, tra European traders, by the Danish, giving them rock candy, very sticky stuff, okay. 
Um, they had other dental problems, okay, but not caries. Okay, so not having caries doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have perfectly healthy teeth, but there's very good uh, evidence uh, that there is a link between sugar consumption and caries, you know, historical public health evidence. Sugar does a number of things, and different sugars are not all alike. All sugars can be used by the caries producing bacteria to produce acid, okay? In addition, however, sucrose is particularly cariogenic because strep mutans and other bacteria can use sucrose selectively to create a polysaccharide matrix that it uses to essentially glue itself to the two surface and protect itself from its environment. So sucrose is particularly cariogenic. All uh, all sugars can be used to cr generate acid. However, sucrose also is used by bacteria to generate this glycan, what's called glycan, the polysaccharide matrix. Okay, so sucrose is actually more cariogenic than other other sugars. Okay, now the important thing here is that many bacteria don't live well, don't exist, you know, don't survive well when exposed to acid. The caries producing bacteria have a couple of traits that are pathogenic that help them cause this disease. One is that they produce acid. The other is that they actually tolerate acid. Okay, so if you keep exposing the plaque to sugar, and if you have these organisms, okay, what will happen is these organisms will take over the plaque because they are able to produce acid and tolerate acid, whereas other organisms will actually go down. So they, they will be able to shift the ecology to favor themselves. This is a very important process in caries. Okay, So it's not really a simple infection. Okay, It's a complicated infection where basically it's our own bacteria and by our diet and other factors, which I'll talk about in a second, we can favor the bad guys over the good guys. Okay, so one way we can do this is by frequent exposure of the plaque to sugar. So these little depressions are called Stefan curves, okay, where every time the plaque is exposed to sugar, it produces acid. If the pH of the plaque goes below a certain level, 5.5 for enamel, you can get mineral loss from the enamel and caries. So the more often this happens, the worse it is. Okay, the more often this happens, the more likely there is to be caries. Now at night, when you don't have saliva flow, it's even worse. Now, so what happens is there's sugar exposure, a drop in the pH, and then the saliva causes the pH to go back up. At night, you know, everybody's mouth's a little dry when they wake up. So in, at night, there isn't enough, a lot of saliva flow. So there is an even worse drop in the pH. If you have food or things like sugar right before bedtime and you don't brush your teeth. Okay, so I, I gave this on a cruise ship. So I included uh, this course on a cruise ship. So I included midnight buffet. You have all this great cake and stuff. If you go to sleep and don't brush your teeth, you can get a big acid attack at night when there isn't the saliva flow. Okay, so eating sugar, sugar, sugar all the time is a lot worse than eating sh sugar with meals. Because remember what I said, the highest rate of saliva flow is during a meal. When you're thinking about food, when if you're eating things that have a strong taste, like cheese for instance, that will increase your saliva flow. So Pairing sugar with like cheese or a meal is less damaging than having candy, candy, candy all the time. So having a big cake, piece of cake for dessert is probably less damaging to your teeth than having little candies all, all the time. And the worst thing, of course, is to have sugar at bedtime because there you don't have the saliva flow. Now, low saliva flow predisposes you to very bad caries. Okay, so saliva is very important. Sal the saliva flow is controlled by nerves. Okay, so any medication that affects the nervous system, the heart, 
you know, any happy pills, sad pills, blood pressure pills, anything for the heart, antihistamines, of course, uh, psychiatric medications of various forms, which many of our patients these days are taking, will cause a dry mouth or potentially cause a dry mouth. Okay, anxiety, depression, uh, certain diseases can cause a dry mouth, like Sjogren's syndrome, okay, which is a autoimmune disease. The granddaddy of them all, however, is radiation. Radiation that damages the salivary ducts can predispose people to very, very serious caries indeed. Okay. So some examples where things go wrong, uh, radiation caries here is, you know, would be the, the, the grand, you know, the grandpa of them all, but also nursing bottle mouth, what we should call early childhood caries, okay? You put the baby to bed at night, okay? The juice or milk, whatever, milk is bad too, okay? Uh, will cover the upper front teeth, okay? The lower front teeth are essentially protected from the bottle, so let's say the nipple of the bottle is right here, Okay, the lower front teeth are protected. There is some saliva coming out of the, the ducts uh, next to the tongue. Okay, these are not, they get very little saliva flow. They have the substrate all night, so you can get very, very bad caries, mostly of the maxillary anterior teeth, but then eventually all the teeth. Meth mouth is something we're seeing a lot of. Okay, R really a big problem. In drug abusers, the diet is bad, okay? The diet's mostly candy, soft, mushy stuff. They don't brush their teeth before they go to sleep. There is some possibility that the drug may uh, have a direct chemical effect or reduce saliva flow. But I actually think that the reason drug abusers, uh, including methamphetamine abusers, uh, get severe caries is the fact that it's the oral hygiene versus uh, the oral hygiene as well as the fact that they just, you know, like kind of are very indiscriminate about their diet. Okay. Um, how does compliance affect uh, studies on oral hygiene methods used to ma manage biofilms? Okay. This is a good question because if you do very controlled studies, okay, very, very controlled studies, a lot of things work. Okay, good example is chlorhexidine. Chlorhexidine uh, works against caries in very, very tightly controlled studies. In bigger studies where you maybe have less control over compliance, it doesn't work as well. Okay, so efficacy is the ability to control, you know, is, is, is the effectiveness is, is basically how well something works in a small study where you have basically all the variables under control. Effectiveness is where you can't control everything. So a lot of oral hygiene parameters, modalities have very good efficacy, but sometimes the effectiveness is a little disappointing. Uh, oral hygiene, flossing for instance, it is very hard to prove that flossing works. So I think I, I talk about that a little bit here. Okay, so 100 years ago, G.V. Black said, a clean tooth doesn't, uh, doesn't decay, okay? Today, the benefits of oral hygiene are a little controversial, okay? So sometimes it's hard to demonstrate effectiveness, even though efficacy in small studies is demonstrable, okay? Now, some people with terrible oral hygiene don't get caries because they simply don't have cariogenic organisms, okay? So people, some older people that have periodontal disease may have very little caries even though they may have very heavy plaque accumulations and have other dental diseases. Okay? Um, okay, uh, other questions, power toothbrushes versus um, versus manual uh, toothbrushes. In my evidence-based dentistry uh, uh, course, one of the students, uh, a team of students did a presentation on that. There is some evidence that power toothbrushes do work better. I, in general, have not been in the habit of recommending them, uh, but it, it's it's an interesting question. I think there is some evidence that people uh, might benefit from using uh, power toothbrushes. Okay, but I think more so than the type of toothbrush, it's, it's kind of where you put it. Okay, the early manifestation of, of caries is what's called the white lesion. So this is 
mild demineralization. Most of the demineralization is actually below the surface, okay, where the surface is intact, and you get this white roughening of the, the, the two surface, okay. So I think white spots are very often seen after people get orthodontic treatment. So the brackets are removed. Uh, there was plaque accumulation around the, the brackets, and there was a white spot. White spots will fade away, partially remineralize, and arrest using uh, it with good oral hygiene and especially with the application of fluoride. Okay, so white spots, are, even though they represent the early stage of caries, they really do not need restorative treatment. Okay, so if you want to tell your professor hey, there's a white spot and you want to do a composite, that's really the wrong thing to do. What one should do is Basically, allow the patient to brush, plaque removal, diet, and if it's exposed to you know good saliva conditions and not demineralized by sh by sugar and plaque uh, exposure, they will stabilize and and basically revert to a certain extent. So, in a study, people who were told not to brush their teeth and were given a sucrose rinse develop white spots after just a couple of weeks. Okay, just a couple of weeks they develop white spots. Okay, so mechanical plaque control is important because rather than destroying or removing all the biofilm, it thins the plaque, okay? It prevents microorganisms from forming that and it prevents really the overgrowth of the plaque by particular types of organisms. It allows fluoride and saliva better penetration into the plaque to affect, you know, anti-cariogenic effects. And basically, white spots, if you remove the plaque from them, essentially, they will essentially stabilize. They will either reverse or at very least, they will stop getting worse. Okay, so in a big study that was done, uh, you know, people expected white spots always to lead to cavities. It was found to be really the m minority, the tiny minority of white spots in studies where people used a fluoride toothpaste were actually found to uh, progress into cavitated lesions. Okay. Now, all of this type of demineralization goes on, on in the pits and fissures where it's a little harder to diagnose and a little bit harder to really assess because the pits and fissures, you know, there's a dipping down of the tooth surface into the tooth. Okay, so in pits and fissures, the fissure wall can become demineralized and, and eventually lead to cav caries uh, progression into the, uh, into the dentin. The long and short of this, the really, the way to prevent this and even to treat it at the relatively early stages are sealants. Okay, sealants. Sometimes we're not really sure if a little bit of caries has developed within the pits and fissures. It has been shown that if it's sealed, essentially whatever is going on there will stop. Okay, so we don't really have to worry too much about sealing in decay and the decay destroying the tooth. If you deprive the demineralization process of contact with the sugar that we eat, essentially, it will stop, okay? So pits and fissure sealants are very effective ways at, we, you can even say treating the early stages of occlusal caries. Fluoride has a number of anti-caries effects. Uh, first of all, it is somewhat antimicrobial. It also uh, interacts with the tooth mineral to create a fluoridated tooth mineral, which is resistant to acid, okay? It forms precipitates on the surface, and it basically biases the demineralization, remineralization uh, process in favor of remineralization. One quick thing about uh, the surface of the white spot is once a white spot remineralizes, it usually increases its fluoride content, and it actually is more resistant from fur to further acid attack than the original tooth structure. So a remineralized white spot is actually not a weak spot, but could be considered actually a strong spot in terms of future caries activity. 
Other mineralizing treatments, there are quite a bunch of, so, you know, this is one thing where we have to be uh, on top of the literature uh, critically, not, you know, not necessarily uh, believing everything salesmen tell us, but uh, there's something called uh, recaldent, which is calcium phosphate and the peptide found in milk. Basically, the milk delivery peptide is, is used in dental products. I think this is called um, GC paste. Okay, th that's the current product that has this. This works to basically increase the calcium in plaque and can help uh, facilitate remineralization. Okay, so, so there are this and a bunch of other new remineralization promoting uh, agents that are being developed and basically introduced into dental products both in the United States and, and throughout the world. Okay, so caries, one of the things I like about it is it's, it's science and also it's people science. Okay, so it's where basically behavior and biology meet. Okay, so Important factors are the transmission of the caries producing organisms, uh, plaque accumulation, basically the modification of the plaque by both the saliva environment and by the diet. Okay, so by if you have low saliva and if you have a diet that favors these organisms, they will take over because they are the acid tolerating organisms. They make acid and they don't mind the acid whereas other organisms will drop off, okay? And then there's the effect of, of the tooth mineral and the effect of fluoride. So we don't think of fluoride as really a medicine that cures caries, okay? It is just a factor that will kind of tilt the process away from caries, okay? So in order to really prevent and manage caries, we can't just hand patients a bottle of fluoride, a jar, a bottle of fluoride we have to basically look at the risk factors comprehensively. You know, can't, don't just say don't eat candy and use fluoride, okay? We, we have to get into it a little bit more detail. Saliva flow, you know, people can chew gum, increase their saliva flow at certain times, but in general, people are kind of stuck with their saliva flow. So really the important thing is the diet and the plaque accumulation and the diet pattern, okay, not eating snacks before bedtime, things like that. Those are very important factors that can be used to basically modify, hopefully, a person's future uh, caries experience. Okay, so dental caries remains one of the most common and costly diseases to affect us, okay, humankind. Okay, caries in children, biggie, more common than uh, then asthma, hay fever, uh, chronic bron bronchitis, and there are marked uh, disparities. Okay, it's usually said that 20% of the population has 80% of the disease, so it is still a, a problem, particularly in families where the bacteria is transmitted and in underserved uh, underserved served groups. What is next in biofilm research? Uh, what study do you think? is missing in the literature today. I think, well, I think what's missing in the literature today is really a more concrete idea of ways to intervene in the caries transmission process, okay, the, the, the passage of the bacteria between the mother and child. I think that's really a bad point in our understanding and our management of caries. Unfortunately, I work for an agency that supposedly was supposed to do something about this, and it really, I don't think the efforts were really very targeted. What's next in, in, in biofilm research? I think is understanding, studies that understand the ecology of the biofilm, okay? So rather than really targeting individual organisms and looking for like, magical bullets, so to speak. It's more understanding the ecology and how to tilt the ecology in the way of health. So it's almost like the antibiotic mentality, I don't think is really going to work here, okay, because I think what we need is a more ecological view, a more balanced view. So we need to tilt the balance back. So really, more links between making uh, things that appear to work and small studies work
Another good example of that is xylitol. Okay. All right. So uh, xylitol works in small studies. Big studies were hard. We're tough. So there was a big study called the gummy bear study in Alaska. Not that easy to do. Okay, I have time maybe for another question or two. And I would like to thank you very much for your attention this evening. Uh, I've enjoyed my time with you all. Um, please be sure to enroll in next DDS and uh, join us in the next few weeks for our next presentation in essentials and oral health. Uh, we're going to close with a quick survey, okay, if you don't, if there aren't any other uh, questions. Uh, and I thank you very much for your attention this evening. Uh, wish you all really all the best with uh, your future educational uh, and professional endeavors. I think we're in a great profession. I love being a dentist. I love being a uh, dental academic, academician. Okay. And I, you know, wish you all the best. Okay, thank you. And, okay, so do the survey, and I am going to end the webcast, and I wish you all a good night.